Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. We have a busy docket, so let's get to it. First, packing up the Chad DeBell and Lori Vallow circus. That's right, we're hitting the road. Second, police acknowledge in the Brian Laundry case, well, they're not really sure what to believe anymore regarding the parents. Everybody has a price, and a United States Navy engineer's price was $100,000. A Summer Wells update. RHIP rank has its privileges. Just ask Prince Andrew. Another teacher gone wild. And then finally, our dumb criminal contestant of the day. Let's talk about it. Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk, the most fact-driven, unbiased true crime channel. Now, the channel where a practicing criminal defense attorney explains the facts, the procedure, and the law to cold cases and current actual criminal cases. Welcome. If you've not already done so, please hit that subscribe button, hit the thumbs up, hit that little bell so you receive notifications when we go live. And as always, leave me a comment below about what you think about the cases that we discussed today. Now, don't forget to listen to this show and past shows by downloading Crime Talk on all of our favorite podcasting apps like Apple, Spotify, iHeart, Android, Amazon Music, and Audible. That's right, we're there. Now, as always, we have to support the people that support Crime Talk. Now, according to the FDA, there are currently no nationwide shortages of food. Although in some cases, the inventory of certain foods at your local grocery store might be temporarily low before the stores can restock them. Now, if you go to the link crimetalkprep.com and you can claim your three month emergency food kit. Now, in today's world of supply chain shortages and unknown changing rules, you don't know what will be next. I went to Costco the other day and they were back again, limiting toilet paper again. I went to the dealership for a new tire the other day. What happened? That's right, a six week wait for a new tire. You have to be prepared for the unexpected. When you go to crimetalkprep.com, you'll receive $100 off the best selling three month emergency food kit. This food stays fresh for up to 25 years as long as it's in proper storage, so it will be there when you need it. All the meals in the food kit average over 2,000 calories per day, so don't wait. Go to crimetalkprep.com, get your emergency food kit. You'll be happy you did. All right, next on the docket. That's right, the circus will be packing up because Judge Stephen Boyce has granted Chad DeBell's request to move the trial from Fremont County and it will likely end up in Boise. Now, John Pryor, who's Chad DeBell's attorney, argued that significant media attention would affect the ability to find a fair and unbiased jury in Fremont County. Now, Pryor requested that proceedings move to Ada County and Boyce granted the motion. Judge Boyce wrote in his ruling, the court has no doubt that absent the extraordinary circumstances presented here, Fremont County would have been an ideal location for this trial and an ideal jury pool from which to select triers of fact to determine this case. However, this is no ordinary case. The prosecuting attorneys Rob Wood and Lindsey Blake argued that the trial should remain in Fremont County. They requested a sequestered jury could be brought in from another part of Idaho, but Judge Boyce denied that request. The court has determined that a transfer within the 7th Judicial District, such as Idaho Falls, Rigby, or Blackfoot, Idaho, would not alleviate the issue of case publicity. In making his decision, Judge Boyce said he considered the population from which to draw jurors, courthouse facilities, personnel staffing, courtroom availability, control of citizens and media attendance, and jury security. Now, Lori's case, Lori Vallis' case, is still on hold after Judge Boyce committed her to the Idaho Department of Health and Welfare back in June when a mental health professional determined that she was not fit to stand trial because she was not competent to proceed. Now, a trial date for Chad DeBell's case has not been set. 
have to commend Judge Boyce on making this decision early. Let's get this one over with, all right? The whole idea of bringing in jurors from the other part of the state, never seen it done. Can't imagine why it would be a, an efficient use of judicial resources in any way possible. Just pick up the show. Everybody's going to be inconvenienced by it, the court, the prosecutors, the defense, but it's a death penalty case. So the court, to make sure that the record is clean, basically has to make sure Chad Daybell gets super due process. That's right. That's a, that's a very lawyer-like term, super due process. But in a death penalty case, that's what people get. So we'll have to wait and see. Hopefully a trial date will be set shortly and the case will proceed. Now, as we mentioned, Lori Vallow is committed and she's been deemed not competent. And well, the newly released documents in the Vallow uh, de Bell matter reveal some shocking details of Lori Vallow's cult-like belief system of zombies and vibrations, plus more details of Charles and Lori's separation. Now, we have received all of the documents and we're putting up all of the videos in regards to the Chandler Police Department investigation. And we all heard stories about the whole being possessed and zombies and things like that. Uh, but why it wasn't acted upon early on, a little surprising. Why people weren't a little more concerned, a little surprising to say the least. But go check those out. Our Patreons are getting all that stuff uploaded uh, right now, and then the videos will be available shortly. So the Chandler Police Department released uh, documents last week, which included a detailed look into the lives of Lori and Chad Daybell um, via text message, computer files, and interviews with close friends and family members. In the main investigation report, the Chandler Police Detective wrote that they believed Charles Vallow was murdered and that his suspected killers were motivated by greed for Vallow's life insurance money, lust for each other, and strange religious beliefs. We're going to try to upload these thousands of pages of documents and pictures to the Crime Talk Patreon page this afternoon. Uh, now, Chad DeBell and Lori Vallow communicated with each other using code names or pet names like Lily, Bubby, Raphael, and sometimes uh, standard text messaging instead of using burner phones or messaging systems inside of a karaoke phone app. Now, this is according to computer and phone files found by the investigators. Now, as the relationship between Lori and Chad grew, so did their cult-like religious beliefs, according to investigators. Several family members and friends interviewed by detectives described them as having a strange doomsday-focused belief system, and some of the friends acknowledged adopting the beliefs as well. At times, as many as 10 people were part of the loose religious group that met to pray, drive out evil spirits, and seek revelations from beyond the spiritual veil. Though the beliefs of Lori Vallow's friends described the detectives were loosely based in theology from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they veered into the extreme. The report said Lori and Chad DeBell believed in reincarnation and that Lori DeBell was a goddess sent to bring the second coming of Christ. The pair also allegedly believed that they had special powers with Lori Vallow telling one of the friends that she could teleport between Arizona and Hawaii. Chad DeBell reportedly told the group that he had a portal in his home where he could receive revelations and travel to other realms. Lori Vallow's close friend Melanie Gibbs told investigators Chad and Lori DeBell drew people into their circle of believers by giving them bits of information and flattered followers by telling them they were part of the select few who were supposed to carry out this special spiritual mission. Those who questioned the beliefs were pushed out of the group and the Vallow and De Bell used a special scoring system to determine whether people were good or evil, according to Gibbs. Each person was assigned a number to indicate how many times they had lived before, as well as a light or dark rating to indicate if they made a contract with God or Satan. People were also given vibration scores and trustworthiness ratings, and those with high enough vibrations were deemed to be translated 
holding special powers. Vallow and DeBell believed zombies were people who had died and their bodies had been possessed by evil spirits. The group would spend time praying to get rid of the zombies and believed that if they were successful, the possessed person would physically die, freeing their soul from limbo. Lori Vallow told some of her friends that her estranged husband, Charles Vallow, was a zombie, according to investigators, and some in the group regularly joined her in praying for Vallow's demise. After Vallow was shot and killed by Alex Cox, Lori Vallow's brother, during an argument, Cox reportedly told another follower that he didn't feel bad because he killed a zombie. The group also believed that the once a person became exalted, they couldn't be held responsible for their actions on earth. Now, because Lori was already exalted, investigators uh, were told that she would often slam her hand on the counter and state, doesn't count for me. The police investigators also uncovered computer documents that indicated Charles Vallow discovered his wife having an affair with Chad Daybell just weeks before his death. Charles Vallow confronted Lori Vallow in a text message and then reached out to Tammy Daybell to let her know that their spouses were cheating. Text messages released in these documents paint a picture of a romantic relationship between Chad and Lori Vallow long before Tammy Daybell died. Chad, an author of the Latter-day Saint fiction books, began writing his own story to Lori in a series of text messages, according to these documents. A detective described the writings as a romance novel of sorts and noted that it followed a relationship between the couple, but names were changed to James and Elena. When their hands touched, he felt a shock pass through him and his heart started beating fast. The text read, Elena was gorgeous and vivacious, and James was a little intimidated, yet honored that she would talk to him. The story took an R-rated turn with Chad describing in detail a sexual relationship between James and Elena. Throughout the story, James is obsessed with the clothes Elena wore and her physical features, calling her an exalted goddess who had come to earth to perform a special mission. The mission included Elena being with James, Chad sent text messages to Lori telling her that he felt like a grown-up version of Harry Potter who has to live with the Dudleys in his little space under the stairs. He said that every few weeks he gets to have his own time with Lori, his goddess lover, but then has to go back to his family and feels trapped. He ended the text saying he knows that freedom is coming. Lori texts back saying that Chad should spend time with his family and his wife and that she didn't want to be in the way anymore. Despite this, she packed up her and her family's belongings and moved to Rexburg, Idaho at the end of August. Now, on October 5th of 2019, Chad texted Lori, Hello, sweet angel. Big news about Tammy. Please let me know if you're awake and I can talk. I love you. The news was that Tammy had been taken over by a demonic entity named Viola. Chad claimed Tammy's sister was responsible for being possessed and Tammy's personality would change quickly because of this spirit attaching itself to her. He also texted Lori, not fully sure of the time for removal, but once her actions verify the differences, I don't want to wait, Chad wrote. Chad called 911 on October 19, 2019, saying that his wife Tammy had died in her sleep shortly before Tammy's death. Lori's two children, seven-year-old Joshua J.J. Vallow and 16-year-old Tylee Ryan, vanished. Their bodies were found buried in Chad's backyard in June of 2020. So I think it comes to no surprise when you start reading these documents. Sure, we heard a lot about it, but when you listen to these interviews of family members and friends talking about this. Yeah, I can see why the medical professionals have said that she is not competent to proceed. I personally have seen cases where people truly believe that they were special or godlike and they were simply not competent. They were absolutely delusional. Um, we'll see if Lori Vallow can be restored and actually stand trial for the allegations that she has pending against her. We'll have to see. Next on the docket, police are now apparently acknowledging that the stories from Brian Laundrie's parents about their son's disappearance have been, that's right, 
inconsistent and odd. Now, obviously Gabby Petito and Brian Laundrie were on this cross-country road trip when Laundry drove Gabby's van back to his parents' home in Northport, Florida, obviously without Gabby. Laundry later vanished and his parents said to investigators that he told them he was going for a hike in a wilderness preserve near their home in Northport, Florida. That was back on September 13th, but he has not been seen since. In a new interview with the Northport police spokesperson, Josh Taylor, he told the media that he is not sure what to believe anymore. He said that the laundries told police that Brian had taken his car to the reserve and walked into the woods. The parents also initially said that their son had gone to the reserve on September 14th, but later they said that he disappeared one day earlier on September 13th. Now, Taylor said, I think it's certainly possible that they're expressing what they know, but we'll see. This is an ongoing investigation that will continue to evolve. The spokesperson also stated that no investigation is perfect and that police are still examining how laundry has managed to evade authorities for so long. We're coming up on a month. Now, Brian Fathers Chris Laundry is said to have been helping the FBI in the search, but at this point, there's been no evidence of Brian Laundry in the Nature Reserve or any confirmation of claims that he has been spotted around the country. Oh, shocking. If they just watched Crime Talk, they would know that my hunch is that he is south of the border, probably on an island in maybe a little place called Cuba. Just a hunch. But hey, it's got about as much uh, possibility as all the other uh, possibilities being thrown around out there. Now, in a video uh, from Sunday night, take a look at this. Roberta and Chris Laundry are seen collecting laundry baskets left by protesters on their front lawn and taking down memorials for Gabby Petito. They also get some mail out of the mailbox and they removed a sign that said, remember me, Gabby Petito? I once lived with you. Ooh, ouch. The person taking the video asked the laundries a few questions. Do you guys feel guilty about Gabby? Do you know where Brian's passport might be? Roberta and Chris ignored the questions and walked back into their home. Now, on a side note, at least something good has come from all this searching. A body has been discovered by investigators searching for Brian Laundry, but it was in regards to an unrelated search. The FBI has confirmed that the body is part of an ongoing investigation, but has no relation to Brian Laundry. So apparently this nature preserve is where people go to dispose of bodies. And there was also the other gentleman uh, whose body was found in the uh, Grand Teton uh, as a result of the uh, search for Gabby Petito. So at least some good is coming from all of this searching as well. It's not all done in vain. And the cause of death of the remains uh, that were found uh, remain uh, unknown at this time. So it's hard to believe almost a month has gone by since Brian Laundrie has disappeared. And we also, um, as I've question is, I wonder how long all the uh, searches will continue to go on in light of the fact that they've not had any uh, significant hunches or information as to where Brian Laundry may be. Thank goodness, though, at least Dog is out there doing it for free. We know he won't give up. We've mentioned here on Crime Talk a lot of times, it's always about the money. And when they say it's not about the money, then you know it's all about the money. Well, and we've also said that a lot of people, just about everybody has a price. And a United States Navy engineer's price was $100,000. Now, this is absolutely disappointing. I can't believe somebody in our military, it's not the first time it happened. It won't be the last. But selling secrets to a foreign nation, oh, just makes me sick. So this United States Navy engineer and his wife have been busted trying to sell U.S. nuclear secrets to foreign operatives who turned out to be an FBI agent. Jonathan Toby allegedly filled a plastic coated SD card with details about Virginia class nuclear powered attack submarines and hid the digital secrets in a peanut butter sandwich. In a previous attempt, Toby hid an SD card in a Band-Aid wrapper and a pack of chewing gum. Over the course of the undercover operation, the FBI said Toby's $100,000 in cryptocurrency to keep him believing that he was working with a true foreign agent. 
Toby's wife, Diana, served as his lookout for his drops. Toby and his wife were arrested Saturday in Jefferson County, West Virginia, charged with violating the Atomic Energy Act. The complaints say the FBI began its investigation in December of 2020 when they received a package Toby had intended to send to an unidentified country. It contained Navy documents and instructions for the use of encrypted communications. It stated, please forward this letter to your military intelligence agency, Toby allegedly wrote on a note with the package. I believe this information will be of great value to your nation, and this is not a hoax. Well, at least the FBI was reading that. The FBI verified the information, then began posing as spies while communicating via email. Rather disappointing, almost sounds like something out of the Americans. Remember that show on Netflix? God, that was good. Summer Wells, a lot of people keep asking, is there an update on the Summer Wells case? Well, a statement was posted on the Hawkins County Sheriff's Office uh, that insists the Sheriff's Office is still actively investigating the Summer Wells case. The Sheriff's Office also said that they are continuing to ask for the public's help in identifying an older Toyota Tacoma that investigators believe is connected to the case. Now at this time, Wells has been missing for nearly four months and Summer Wells Reward Fund has now surpassed $40,000. Now, according to this statement, the case is one of the highest priorities of the Sheriff's Office. And in a recent interview, the father of Summer stated that he did not want the reward fund to expire. Uh, the fund was established in late of June of 2021 by the Church Hill Rescue Squad. Now, originally, the reward fund was set to expire at the end of December. However, since that interview, the fund's expiration date has extended. So there's your Summer Wells update. Little disheartening that there's really not that much to report other than they continue to investigate and that they're still looking and then asking for help by the citizens, which is code for we have no clue as to what we're actually looking for. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way. It just means they don't have any extensive leads. So hopefully someone somewhere knows what happened to Summer Wells or knows someone that did something to Summer Wells and hopefully they'll come forward and not just for the $40,000 reward money, but because it's the right thing to do. All right, there used to be a saying in the military, R-H-I-P. That's right, rank has its privileges. Just ask Prince Andrew. Well, British police have announced that they will not take any action against Prince Andrew after a review prompted by a Jeffrey Epstein accuser who claims that he sexually assaulted her. Virginia Jeffrey claims that she was exploited by Epstein to have sex with Andrew in London in 2001 when she was only 17, a minor under U.S. law. She is suing the prince in a United States court. Now, in August, the London's Metropolitan Police Force began a review of the allegations connected to late convicted sex offender Epstein. The police chief said at the time that no one is above the law. Now, in a statement late Sunday, the police force said its review has concluded and we are taking no further action. The statement also said it would take no action over allegations that Epstein's alleged accomplice, Ghislaine Maxwell, uh, groomed and abused women and girls in the United Kingdom. Maxwell, a British socialite, is in a U.S. jail awaiting trial on charges that she recruited teenage girls for Epstein. Lawyers for Prince Andrews finally acknowledged late last month that the prince had formally been served with Jeffrey's lawsuit. The prince must file a response to the claims by October 29th. What will the responses be? Uh, deny without sufficient information and therefore deny, bottom line. All right, next on the docket, more school teachers gone wild. That's right, school teacher in Doral, Florida, by the name of Hyrie Calvi, 41, allegedly abused a 15-year-old former student and told a detective she was pregnant. She allegedly did not specify how many months she had been pregnant, nor did she identify the father. The K-8 through Center shares a campus with J.C. Bermuda Senior High School, where a student allegedly showed off a video of him and Calvi having illicit relationships. 
Police said they searched the student's phone. They claimed to have found pictures of him and Calvi naked. A WhatsApp thread where the two exchanged romantic messages, Calvi's credit card being used for the boy, and audio of him telling someone to deny knowing about the relationship with Calvi. The teacher and her former student, who have attended the K-8 Center, spent time together outside of school. Calvi posted a $39,000 bond. She faces charges including lewd and lascivious battery, electronic transmission harmful to minors, contributing delinquency and possession of a firearm on school property, and online records do not name an attorney. An arraignment is scheduled for November 8th. It just goes to show, ladies and gentlemen, you're never exactly sure with whom you are dealing and you need to check them out. That's why everybody needs to go to crimetalksearch.com and get your background subscription service. Please go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up for a background subscription service. You'll be happy you did. If there's anyone out there you were ever curious about, what was in their background, now is the time to do it. If you're going to get involved with somebody, now is the time to do it. When you go to crimetalksearch.com, you put in the name, literally millions of public records are searched and a report is generated. And it's going to give you a report. If they have multiple social media accounts, you're going to find it. If they have multiple phone numbers, multiple email addresses, it's going to be found. And more importantly, you're going to get information regarding criminal history. Hopefully the person you're searching has none whatsoever, but if it's there, it's going to be found. You're going to get everything you'd want to know, whether you're going into business or whether you're going into a personal relationship, you're going to be able to find out the information you want to know. So go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up today. You'll be happy you did. Check it out. Go to crimetalksearch.com. If you're dating in today's world and you're not checking people out on crimetalksearch.com, you're committing dating malpractice. All right, our dumb criminal contestant of the day. You may ask, but Scott, where was our dumb criminal contestant for Friday and last week? Well, as most of you may already know, that's right, Frank had a child. It came early Friday morning, the child did. And so I was doing some traveling, so we just figured we'll just wait. So the plan is we're going to have a huge competition between last week's dumb criminal contestants and this week's dumb criminal contestants and let them all compete. So here is today's contestant. Please meet Demarius Pritchard. Now he is a 21 year old shift manager and he is facing aggravated assault charges following a confrontation last week at a Wendy's. Now, uh, this was in Huntingdown, a town about 150 miles west of Nashville. Pritchett was involved in a verbal altercation with a customer over the food they had received from the drive through window. They were complaining that the food was cold. Pritchett was in the process of giving a cash refund when he went and grabbed a hot oil pan from the deep fryer and doused the customer in hot oil. Pritchett reportedly admitted to throwing the scalding oil on Johnson and said this customer had been harassing him for weeks. Pritchett was arrested and booked into the Carroll County Jail, and he has posted a $5,000 bond. Now, if anyone has ever had to deal with people, you know, in a customer service type environment, you understand um, how difficult it can be. But young Mr. Pritchett, you cannot pour hot oil on people because they are complaining. If it was one day, three days, three weeks, it doesn't matter. You just can't do that. And that's going to be a felony assault because more than likely that hot oil is going to leave some serious burns. It's just bad news. So Mr. Pritchard, you're probably a good guy, a very good guy, no doubt. You're working, doing what you got to do to get by. But what you did, that was a real dumb thing. All right. So you're a dumb criminal contestant of the day. You'll be competing throughout the week, not only against the contestants this week, but last week to decide who is our dumb criminal contestant winner. And what does the winner get? That's right, Crime Talk Swag. This is my personal favorite. I like this one. Lawyer, lawyer, lawyer. Can't go wrong with it. All right, that's all we have for you today. Thanks for watching. 
Don't forget tomorrow, live, 6 p.m., YouTube. Please join us. We'll see you. Have a wonderful day. We'll see you next time on Crime Talk.